Hello, everyone. Once again, on behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in TAC and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Judy Jacob, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Our speaker for today is Judy Jacob. She's a senior conservator with the United States Department of the Interior National Park Service. She works for the Northeast region and is based, based in New York City. Judy works primarily on stone monuments and buildings, large to small, and has had the most experience with marble. She has a current obsession with lichens and biofilms, and she'll be discussing those in our talk today. The title for today's talk is Marble Monuments, Lichens, and Biofilms. Eroded marble surfaces teem with robust communities of algae, bacteria, and fungi. These communities are viewed both as aesthetic disfigurements and as aesthetic enhancements, whether they contribute to the deterioration of marble or serve to protect it from weathering are unanswered questions. This presentation provides an overview of the surface ecology of marble and the relationships between marble, its own ecology, the environment, and preservation interventions. Before I request Judy, start with our presentation. May I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please type in your name, organization name, and email ID in the chat box. Would love to know who all have joined us today. And also type in your questions. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. Thank you, Judy. Over to you now. Thank you, Padma. I'm pleased to be here today. I've been paying close attention to marble buildings and monuments for some 30 years now. What I'm about to present is a summary of my observations, coupled with what I've learned from geologists, lichenologists, and microbiologists of the surface ecology of eroded marble. I will also present a few of the many questions my monuments pose, and for now, all unanswered. There are 421 units of the National Park Service. I work on monuments, buildings and structures in the Northeast region. And for this presentation, I will call them all monuments. You will see photos from Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington DC, Virginia. And in these states, Winters are cold and snowy in Maine and mild in Virginia. Summers are boiling hot in Virginia and lovely in Maine. Over the course of my career, I have worked on many large marble monuments and some of these you may recognize. I have also worked on many small monuments. This cemetery is in the middle of rural Pennsylvania. I will be talking about marble, lichens, these orange areas, and biofilms, these black areas. This handprint is from an eight-year-old boy after he came in from playing outside. Our monuments are always playing outside. They are covered with both microorganisms, life forms that we cannot see with the naked eye, like bacteria, and organisms, things that we can see with the naked eye, like lichens. Here is a simple diagram of the tree of life, comprised of three domains. Eukarya are multicellular organisms whose cells have a nucleus and distinct organism, organs. Bacteria and archaea are prokarya, single-celled organisms whose cells have no nucleus or distinct organs. I will not talk about this entire tree, just three kingdoms and one domain. Organisms and microorganisms in the plant kingdom are phototropes, obtaining nutrients from the sun through photosynthesis. Fungi are heterotropes, obtaining nutrients from organic matter. Animals too are phototropes, to what extent animals play a role in the health and ill health of lichens and biofilms is not fully understood. The bacteria domain contains at least nine kingdoms. Cyanobacteria, like plants, use photosynthesis to obtain their nutrients. 
All other bacteria are heterotrophs. Viruses, while not a life form, will be mentioned in this presentation. Marble is a metamorphic rock composed of interlocking carbonate crystals of calcite or dolomite. Ancillary minerals may include mica, quartz, pyrite, iron compounds, and graphite. Most freshly cut marble is bright white in color. Surfaces are smooth, edges are sharp. Because of its appearance when new, its relative ease of cutting, and the abundance in the Northeast, it was commonly used for monuments of all sizes. Marble was for the ages. Except that it really wasn't for the ages. This is exactly what caretakers don't want. Surfaces are no longer white and smooth and edges are ill-defined. The marble has eroded a natural and inevitable process and a bioreceptive surface has been created, a surface that provides the perfect living conditions for lichens, which you can barely see in this photo, and a biofilm, the black covering. I often bring a sample of Vermont Danby marble on site visits. It's from a quarry that furnished much of the marble for monuments in the Northeast and has a sanded or rubbed finish like that of most architectural stone. This little sample makes it easy to see differences between new and eroded marble and is a tremendous aid in explaining that no preservation treatment will make a century old or even decade old monument appear as it was when new. And you can all laugh, I'm in the United States where a hundred years is a long time. Well, do lichens and biofilms contribute to the deterioration of marble or to the protection of marble? Do they serve as an umbrella protecting marble from rain and weathering? Or do they serve as jackhammers creating fissures between crystals or both at the same time? These are unanswered questions. How much can we learn about marble monuments by observing surface conditions with our own eyes or aided by a simple hand lens? The answer is a lot. I will introduce the notion of bioreceptivity by talking about weathering and erosion. Weathering is defined as physical and chemical changes brought about by temperature fluctuations, ultraviolet light, moisture, and pollutants. Blocks of marble on the Lincoln Memorial have turned yellow. Iron compounds within the stone have oxidized. These blocks are at the very top of the memorial and not readily visible to the public. For Shard Villa in Vermont, gray marble was used for the body and white marble for the corner pieces, the coins. Over time, the coins have weathered, making them practically indistinguishable from the rest of the marble. This gravestone is bending. Two years later, it had toppled. Daily and seasonal temperature fluctuations, cold, hot, cold, hot, lead to microfissures between crystals. When temperatures rise, calcite crystals expand in one direction and contract perpendicularly to that direction. When temperatures fall, the opposite occurs. Such movements cause internal crushing and fractures. As these microfracture populations grow, they compromise the structural cohesiveness of a marble block. Like osteoporosis in an older person, loss of structural cohesiveness in bone leads to hunching over, bending, and eventual toppling. In marble, microfissures networks also increase porosity and permeability. This is a backscattered electron image of a polished thin section of marble from the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. Carbonate crystals are irregular in size and shape and are tightly locked together. Erosion is the loss of material due to prolonged weathering, rain, acid deposition, temperature change, wind, and ultimately gravity. Calcite is slowly dissolved by acid deposition and rain now about pH 5 in Washington. Microfissures created by weathering are enlarged. Marble, and especially the surface, loses its cohesive unity. Once tightly locked crystals become gradually less so until wind or gravity remove them entirely. Erosion results in a condition commonly called sugaring. 
Just by rubbing my finger over the surface of this capital, I was able to dislodge crystals that were only barely attached to their parent body. I've spent the last six years working on Memorial Amphitheater in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. I took this picture after a long downpour. The force of the rain dislodged crystals and sent them to the paving below. I was shocked to see just how erasive, how erosive a rainstorm can be. The Washington Monument was constructed during two different periods. A marble boulder from the same Maryland quarry as that used for the top portion sits on the campus of Goucher College. This boulder has both weathered and eroded. The surface is dark yellow and has a rough topography. Carbonate crystals have been lost and harder, insoluble ancillary minerals stand proud. Weathering and erosion may not be uniform. For this gravestone, two natural phenomena have been augmented by repeated and likely aggressive cleaning. These three gravestones were cleaned several years before I took this photo. I noticed that the bottom halves of the slabs are not as eroded as the tops and still display the gray white modeling of the marble. Well, I don't know for sure, I'm guessing that deep snow insulates the bottoms from daily transitions of the hot sun and the nighttime cold of winter. Tall grass might also have served a protective function. Pollutants, primarily acid compounds, contribute to the erosion of marble. In 1966, New York City was not a healthy environment for its citizens, its marble monuments, or for its lichens and biofilms. These two gravestones date to the 1820s. The gravestone on the right is in downtown Manhattan and has eroded to an illegible status. The gravestone on the left is in rural Virginia, where pollution levels were and are considerably lower than those of New York. While marble likely came from different quarries and New York has colder winters than Virginia, it would be difficult not to attribute these differences to pollutants. In marine environments, salt mists surround marble monuments and contribute to erosion. A much greater contribution is that made by de-icing salts used in northern climates. Instead of shoveling snow, salts are strewn or dumped on snow to facilitate its melting. Sometimes piles of salts are left behind after snow has melted. Marble monuments are greatly affected by everything we do to keep them clean and solid. Cleaning operations attempt to remove dust, dirt, and any unwanted material. Cleaning is performed by caretakers, conservators, and here, the ladies club. Water and detergents are common cleaning mediums, also used for many different chemicals and abrasives. If there's a water source, I almost always assume a history of cleaning. Cleaning may change surface characteristics of marble in much the same ways as natural weathering and erosion. Cleaning in all forms can be fashionable. Advertising broadcasts the evils of soiling, in this case, mold. I won't be talking about mold because mold does not grow on marble. This ad was pulled soon after it was issued. In 1959, this gentleman applied a quote, liquid preservative to a camel outside the Seattle Museum of Art. I wrote to the museum asking for information on this treatment and they had no record of it. While I would like to think that mystery, quote, liquid preservatives are not common, I know better. More recently, a waterproofing agent was applied to this freshly cleaned statue at Versailles. Waterproofing agents are designed to fill pores and microfractures, repel water, and lower the bioreceptivity of a surface. That is a good idea for design, but it doesn't always work that way. I'm now ready to talk about the ecology of surfaces. Algae, algae is an informal term for a large and diverse group of organisms and microorganisms in the plant kingdom. They photosynthesize and produce the green pigment chlorophyll. The green covering here is algae. 
There could be some cyanobacteria, but algae is much more common in the Northeast. Only needing the sun and water to protect, to produce nutrients, phototrophs are the first colonizers of marble, becoming lodged in between crystals. The animal kingdom is represented here by slug or snail trails. I don't know if the trails represent food or if they represent an anti-algae agent that gets left behind as a marker of a long journey. This is a lichen. Lichens are symbiotic organisms with fungi providing the structure and the name and a photosynthesizing partner, algae or cyanobacteria providing nutrients. The thallus is the visible body of the lichen. Foliost lichens take the form of little leaves. In this very simple diagram, you can see the thread-like structures of the fungus called hyphae and the algae cells. You can see how the hyphae create the thallus, envelop the algae cells, and secure the mass to the substrate. Hyphae position themselves in recesses between crystals. Crustose lichens barely protrude from their substrate. I have no idea how old these lichens are and if there's a sequence to the growth of the community. Lichens are substrate specific. Only some grow on calcareous materials. Most lichens are pollution intolerant. There are only about six or seven lichens found on marble monuments in cities in the Northeast. Crustose lichens are often called endolithic lichens, growing within the stone. However, a stone, whatever stone it is, is not a uniform mass with a surface. Eroded marble has no clear exterior and interior, especially near the surface. The lichen on the bottom left is growing under the lip of a coping stone at Memorial Amphitheater. It is found under the entire lip, but nowhere else. In this location, it is protected from the sun and fast drying. A short distance away, the coping stones of the Jefferson Memorial have a drip edge cut into them, preventing water from running down the parapet. There are no lichens under these coping stones. This cemetery is right on the coast of Maine. The Xanthoria parietina, the orange lichen, is only found in marine environments. When you look at lichens through a hand lens or under a microscope, you're often surprised by little mites crawling around. I'll jump every time I see one of these. The dark stuff on marble is often called dirt. Here, the right shoulder was freshly unearthed and is partly covered with dirt, sort of a light brown color. The left shoulder and full dye lying on the ground is covered with a biofilm. A biofilm is a microbial community composed of many species of microorganisms held together and to a substrate by a self-produced sticky polymeric matrix known as the extracellular polymeric substance or EPS. Primary community members are phototrophs, algae and cyanobacteria, and heterotrophs, fungi and bacteria. The EPS pr protects the community from stress, prevents desiccation, and provides for the transport of nutrients, waste, and loose DNA. The term biofilm was first published in 1975. Like lichens, biofilms become established in micro fissures and in between crystals where there is water and protection from sun and wind. Black pigments are produced by microorganisms to protect their DNA from UV radiation. Melanin is one such pigment. My skin produces melanin when I go out in the sun. With enough melanin, called a suntan, my skin doesn't burn. This confocal laser scanning image is of a biofilm from the LinkedIn Memorial. The blue blobs are phototrophic communities and the green blobs are heterotrophic communities. The red strands are the EPS. This SEM image gives yet another view of the EPS. You can imagine a biofilm as a well-functioning city with a full transportation network, a steady supply of groceries, a full force of sanitation workers, and a police force that protects its citizens from invaders. This diagram illustrates the role of the persisters. 
When a toxin comes in contact with the biofilm, an instant response signal is sent out, resulting in the protection of some of the community. The persisters can't be killed. Inococolus radiodurans has been found on two of my monuments. This bacteria has been subject to massive doses of radiation, acids, and conditions of outer space. It just goes right on living. The gravestone on the left has streaks of black biofilms. The gravestone on the right has a uniform matte gray covering, something I've only seen or only seen thus far in rural locations. It too is a biofilm. The more I look at biofilms, the more visual variations I find. I visited the Carrara marble quarries in Italy a few years ago. My friends marveled at the bright white marble while I marveled at the biofilms. You can see freshly cut white marble and long ago cuts that are now black. These are the rock fragments left by the side of the road. They're almost uniformly black and I have no idea how long they have been here or how long it took for the biofilm to form. The Federal Hall National Memorial is located on Wall Street in New York City completed in 1842. Foundation, walls, columns, and roof slabs are dolomitic marble quarried just north of the city. My office is in the basement. Dolomitic marble erodes to form craggy little mountains. To my surprise, the roof is covered with lichens. Candelariella arela is a pollution tolerant species. I wish I knew if they were present or not, during New York's worst pollution period. The black material in between crystals and in the fractures is a biofilm. Of course, everything else that has fallen from the sky is caught in these crystals as well. Carbon particles, pollen, spores, salts, pulverized organic matter, etc. Here is one of the crystals from the roof. The red blobs are phototrophic communities and the green blobs are heterotrophic communities. The communities sit right on top of the crystal, with the EPS holding them in place. Memorial Amphitheater was built between 1915 and 1920 of Vermont Danby marble. The parapet has a blotchy appearance with white and black areas in a seemingly random arrangement. Calcite marble erodes to form boulder fields of rounded crystals. Biofilm is situated in between the boulders. In small, seemingly random locations, matte gray biofilms cover the crystals. This tiny crustose lichen is only visible once you start looking at the marble from a distance of five centimeters or so. Hyphae secure the thallus to the surface where they can. What I could see with my hand lens, and perhaps what you can see here is a little mound of crystals with the lichen on top. The lichen seems to be holding these crystals in place. In 2017, we performed some biofilm reduction tests on the amphitheater. What we were not expecting, what we were really shocked to find was development of these white spots adjacent to the test. Each spot is surrounded by a little rim. It has been suggested that a virus might be involved somehow preventing melanin production in these locations. To better understand rates of marble erosion and the development of biofilms, I have been comparing historic photographs with present conditions. For this gravestone, it is easy to see the advance of the biofilm, which also indicates the advance of surface erosion. This gravestone is in the same cemetery I only noticed the change in appearance while I was going through my photos for this talk. I don't know why the stone is so much more spotted now, and I wish I had taken some close-ups. So I quote here, bottom bases of all finished work will be of inferior marble and sand finished unless otherwise ordered. I do not know what inferior marble is. The bottom stone of the gravestone is granite. The three upper stones are marble, as is the small stone in front, the foot stone that is used to mark the foot end of the grave but has been moved back. 
If inferior marble is used for bases, it is likely used for footstones too. And why two of the four marble, marble pieces of this gravestone are covered with a biofilm is something I don't understand. If inferior marble erodes more quickly or more readily hosts a biofilm, I would love to know why and how inferior marble was determined in the quarry or stone yard. This is the same gravestone. There's clearly a relationship between the lichens and the biofilm. Both ebb and flow, and the biofilm seems to change its density. I'm still trying to figure this out. At the beginning of my career, 30 years ago, I loved cleaning outdoor marble. I thought marble should be white. At some point, I don't know when, preservation practitioners and the preservation industry started attributing stone deterioration to biocolonization. Biological warfare was necessary to protect stone from lichens and biofilms. There was scant discussion of relationships of organisms and microorganisms to natural erosion, to salts, to cleaning agents and methods. There was no discussion of bioprotection. About 15 years ago, I be began questioning all of this. In 2004, I conducted a cleaning test on the backs of three gravestones. I used water for the stone. On, I used water for the stone on the left. I used calcium hypochlorite, a common cleaning agent at the time, for the stone in the middle. And for the stone on the right, I used a product that was new to the market and contained quaternary ammonium compounds, quats. Initially, the quats product was the most successful. Ten years after cleaning the biofilm had mostly returned to all three stones and something else happened too. By this date, a lichen population was clearly visible on the stone cleaned with quartz, a population that was not there initially. Aristotle's adage, nature abhors a vacuum holds true. By removing one community, another community moved in. What does this mean for the stone? Did decomposition products of the quats create a food source for the new community? I don't know. In 2010, these gravestones had been recently cleaned. I don't know what was used, but I do know I found an empty container of bleach, sodium hypochlorite, thrown in the trash nearby. It's a good thing to investigate trash when you're going to visit the cemetery. Seven years later, the biofilm is returning to be expected. Does this mean another cleaning? With each successive cleaning, are we creating more robust biofilms, more tolerant of stress with more persisters? In 2007, I worked on a set of garden urns in Maryland. We used soft brushes and low pressure water for rinsing. In the end, the urns were white and we had souvenirs of our cleaning effort right in our hands. This cleaning was clearly not a preservation treatment. I began my work on Memorial Amphitheater in 2014. The administration did not like the biofilm and wanted it gone. I made a few tests of products containing quats, looking both at the differences between products and different concentrations. By now, I can say that there were no clear differences between products and no clear differences between concentrations. Here's the more interesting part. The bright orange color you see is the instant reaction of the biofilm being doused in quats. The quats penetrate cell enclosures and release carotenoids. These pigments then fade away after a few days or a week. I then decided to test for biofilms or specifically biofilms containing cells containing carotenoids. There's a black biofilm and a white spot on this coping stone. I put a drop of quartz on the black area and it turned orange. I then put a drop on the white spot. It too turned orange. The biofilm covers this area, but it isn't producing melanin. So I've given you a very brief introduction to the weathering and erosion of marble monuments, to their bioreceptive surfaces, and to the lichens and biofilms that inhabit these surfaces. I've strung together many of my observations I will now add a few more observations, add some questions, and encourage us all to keep studying 
the surface ecology of our marble monuments. First, pay attention to the shapes and colors and locations of biofilms. Look at white areas just as closely as black areas and gray areas too. Find a microbiologist to develop a means to inoculate a monument with a white biofilm. When looking at lichens, pay equal attention to the lichen and to the area left behind when the lichen falls from the stone. In this case, the entire center of the lichen has fallen. I don't see any difference in the condition of the marble that used to be under the lichen and that outside the outer edge of the thallus. This is a little difficult to see, but these black crustose lichens stand proud of the surface existing as little islands. The marble has eroded away around them, not under them. Here, lichens cannot possibly be blamed for causing the erosion of marble. Europeans use the term biopitting to describe small pockmarks in marble. There is a theory that these are the locations of former lichens where lichens have burrowed their way into the stone. I have never heard this term in the United States, nor have I seen the pitting that is found on the neck of this statue. I'm going to make a large jump to a hypothesis regarding this particular biopitting. In 1799, an article describing cleaning attempts of statuary in Paris and Versailles was translated into English and published in London in the monthly magazine. I quote, those who are charged with cleaning the public statues at Paris and Versailles have found it difficult to select proper materials for this purpose. It was lately demonstrated that this adhering substance which disfigured the marble was not dust, but a kind of lichen or moss, which by attracting itself, by attaching itself to the statues, thus disfigured them. I'm hypothesizing that the adhering substance was a black crustose lichen that was removed with a small sharp tool. Biopitting may be the result of lichen removal, not the lichens themselves. Lichens and biofilms are not always viewed as soiling or aesthetic disfigurement. This marble bust was being sold with its lichen and biofilm covering in a very fancy antiques fair in New York. The dealer complained that the orange lichens don't always last very long. These particular lichens are not pollution tolerant, and I wasn't surprised that they didn't survive their move to the city. Cleaning of marble does not solve problems brought about by weathering, erosion, and in this case, iron pins. Cleaning could not remove the biofilm from the fissures surrounding the pins. Protective coatings do not always protect. I made a winter shelter for a Renaissance baptismal font in a garden a few hours north of New York City. I sometimes wonder if perhaps a summer shelter wouldn't have been better. That would be a hard sell, adding summer shelters to a beautiful garden. Lichens and biofilms can serve as diagnostic tools. On the roof of Federal Hall National Memorial, rainwater runoff paths can be observed. This light streak originates at a point under the metal walkway where elements have been soldered together with lead. Likely the water of this particular path contains just enough lead oxide to inhibit the biofilm's growth. On Memorial Amphitheater, a lichen marks the location of a tiny fissure. I have to wonder if the lichen actually prevents water from entering the fissure. This little fragment is in the same garden as the baptismal font with that winter shelter. In the museum catalog, it is described as being made of sandstone. However, these lichens only grow on calcareous materials. Lichens can be used to aid in the identification of stone. Most importantly, I want people to look closely at their marble monuments. Michaela Schmuel in the middle is a lichenologist and we have worked together on several projects. I want people studying the relationships between marble lichens and biofilms. These high school students have been studying the biofilms on Memorial Amphitheater for their biotechnology and life sciences research lab. 
I also want a multi-year, multidisciplinary study and more than one. As part of a National Science Foundation grant, small weather stations were placed on the roofs of the Jefferson Memorial and Federal Hall National Memorial. Weather data was correlated with metagenomic data of the biofilm to better understand its activity. Federica Villa on the left is a microbiologist now at the University of Milan. Isaac Clapper with his back to the camera is a mathematician at Temple University and the principal investigator for the study. David Bitterman on the right is an architect with my office and well-versed in environmental monitoring equipment. Finally, I'm thrilled that a Renaissance baptismal font in the collection of the National Park Service is featured on the cover of Microbial Ecology. In, 19, in 1891, George P. Merrill, a geologist at the United States National Museum in Washington, now the Smithsonian Institution, summarized his observations of marble erosion and lichen colonization. Quote, a stone is often protected from a serious loss by a coating of lichens or mosses, which by growing over its surface, shielded from the abrasive action. The full effect of growing organisms on the surface of stones is still, however, a matter of dispute. By some authorities, it is thought that they give rise to small amounts of organic, acid, organic acids, which exercise a corrosive influence. By others, they are considered as beneficial since they protect the stone from the sun's rays and the rain and wind. It seems probable that they may exert either a harmful or a beneficial action according to the kind of stone on which they grow and its environment. More observations are necessary before anything definitive can be said. I agree with Dr. Merrill. After 125 years, many, many, many more observations are necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. Um, with your permission, I think we can take up the questions. I think there's an observation. There are no questions. Please type in your question. Uh, so there's an observation by Joyce. Uh, he says the liquid preservative of the 1950s could be magnesium fluoride of silica. This is because there was a similar, this is my experience in Scotland. That's what he's saying. So that's something, but uh, yes, we have the questions now. The first question is, is there an issue of oxalic acid production as a result of photosynthetic action of lichens? I heard, I, someone told me once, a long time ago, there was a conference in Italy on oxalic acid and someone said everyone went into the conference with two theories mm -hmm. and they came of the conference with three theories so that's yes that's a question people ask people talk about acids mm -hmm. and acids as metabolic byproducts lichens and biofilms and they just sort of they throw acids into this category it's all acids but my question is always well what kind of acids are they? And are they in solid or liquid form? And what is the pH of the acid? And what is the quantity of the acid? And are the, is the pH and the quantity the same or more or less than just plain rain? And then one has to ask in a biofilm or a lichen, are the acids then used as nutrients for other microorganisms? I don't think there's a, a clear correlation between acids from microorganisms and organisms digesting stone, digesting marble. Does that, I don't know if that answers the question. So I think it does. So you're saying that also, although there is acid production as a byproduct of lichen colonization, but not even enough evidence to suggest whether those quantities actually and erode marble to the extent that we believe. 
Mm -hmm. that, that's, I think that answers the question. The next question is, I said in the beginning, biofilms may be protective film against further damage. How can we determine if the biofilm needs to be intervened, uh, that is to be cleaned or just left alone at this stage? Is there any way, any technologies to determine the depth of biofilm or lichen colonization so as to determine the damage done? So how does one know whether the film is protective or it's, it's a threat or a damage causing concern? That's the question. That's the, that's the big question. Yes. I, don't, I don't know. And then it depends on the stone and the environment and... Um, that's a huge question. I don't know. And I think these are the questions that we have to start studying. Okay, so no way of determining at this point, no sure way of knowing whether the biofilm is protective in nature or it is causing damage. Or would you recommend uh, no at all unless you see any signs? I mean, for sure. Uh, I think you you've muted oh, yourself. I just I just unmuted myself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was going to say clean. I mean, we don't know if biofilms serve as a deterioration force or a protective force, but cleaning we know causes damage. Cleaning is part of the erosive process. Okay, thank you. The next question is, have you seen the boring action of fruiting body of lichens on marble? Because it's been observed on sandstones. This is the question from Nick Boyce. He's observed it on sandstones. So he wants to know if you've seen such kind of boring action of fruiting body of lichen on marble. So the fruiting bodies are on top of the stone because the fruiting bodies have to release their spores into the air. They're, the fruiting bodies are not are not hidden. It would be the hyphae that are holding that the fruiting bodies holding the thallus in place that have to penetrate the stone to some extent. But it penetration means um, going into a microfissure or wrapping themselves around a grain. They're not tree roots. They don't burrow deep into the stone. And they don't push grains aside. They're going where it's easiest to go, essentially. So if there are fissures and cracks existing already in the stone, that's when you feel the hyphae would make a way, not the other way around. They're lazy, yes. <laughs> OK. The next question is, in cleaning marble, how balanced is mechanical to chemical cleaning? And are they equally important? What would be, what would you advise more mechanical cleaning methods or chemical cleaning methods or maybe? It's, it depends. It always depends. In the United States, both are used. Sometimes, um, sometimes you're really happy with the treatment someone has, has used. And sometimes you see something, you just wish that they'd never been there. You know, everything, a, from a very mild abrasive calcium carbonate blasting versus sandblasting, um, a detergent versus an acid. There's each case is different. Okay. Thank you. The next question is if you could explain in brief how the oxalic acids, carbonic acids, and secondary metabolic, metabolites of the lichens affect the rock minerals in my that's a huge question and not entirely easy to answer. So some of these, um, some of these acids, some of these acids that are the metabolic byproducts, the secondary compounds of lichens are in solid form. They form almost like little plates of armor around the hyphae, essentially protecting the lichen from other um, other organisms or microorganisms. Sometimes when I see a white spot on a stone, 
And I know that lichens have been on that stone. I wonder if the thallus has been removed, is mm -hmm. gone. And yet some of those hyphae with their secondary compounds are still in the stone and still serving their function to retard other organisms and microorganisms from, from coming near to them. Um, that didn't quite make a lot of sense. It's really, that's a very complex question and the answer is not clear, but, and it's different with every lichen and every rock. Um, but remember that all of these questions regarding acids have to include rain. Okay. You know, the amount of acids that actually might leave the entire organism and actually digest stone have to be viewed in comparison with a rainstorm. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, what is your opinion about the use of water ceramic, which is a silica product, as there's some controversy uh, regarding the cleaning of marble using water ceramic? Ceramic. I'm sorry, I don't know what water ceramic is. He says it's a silica product that is used to clean marbles. I've never heard of it. I don't know about that. Abdul Rahim, do you want to explain a little bit about this water ceramic? Ceramic? I haven't heard about this either. Any other questions? Please do yeah. type them. Yeah, Abdul. Yes, madam. Uh, I am Professor yeah. Rahim from Aligarh University. We had a collaborative project with uh, Japanese uh, uh, scientists. Mm -hmm. They they introduced some water ceramic chemical that is a liquid for to clean the marble, uh, particularly for Taj Mahal and all that. That is a silica product. But uh, some of the SI scientists uh, told us that you should not use uh, this product for marble. So there was uh, some controversy. So I just want to know about Madam's opinion. Okay, is it is it also called water glass by any chance? Is it called water glass the same as- no, water ceramic, water ceramic. Not water glass. No, okay. water ceramic, it is a liquid chemical. Okay. And so is it, would it be an ethyl silicate or a alkoxysilane? Think it's a lick. Is it an ethyl silicate? It's a liquid. A liquid chemical, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't speak to that at all. Okay. Every, every time something is put on marble, something else will happen. Hmm. Um, you know, just like the pictures I showed of the waterproofing agent magic, you know, it looks great until algae starts to grow all over it. So the next question is, is the biofilm darker in sunnier, clim sunnier climates as a result of melanin, as you explained? So we should we expect the biofilms to be darker in sunny climates as compared to? That would, that would make sense, right? Um, I th it's possible that the biofilms that I see on our marble buildings in the United States just aren't as old as yours. And, you know, it might take hundreds and hundreds of years for stabilization. Okay. Although nature is never stable, there's always movement. Um, so, that, that would make sense to me. Yeah, so more sun, more melanin production, so darker biofilms, that is something, I think he's saying we can, can we conduct a global study on this? I think it, it yeah. would be a nice study or research if we can uh, see this, if that's the hypothesis, I think it should work. The next question is, there is a study of using oxalic acid treatment for the protection of marble surfaces. So your comments on that using oxalic acid to protect marble surfaces. Oh, I've never heard of that either. But that works in the lichen. I don't know anything about that study. Okay. 
So that's new, but I think that again works in the lichen's favor in a way. If you're saying they produce oxalic acids and oxalic acids then protect the marble surfaces, if we can kind of reach that kind of relationship, I think it works in each each lichen produces diff a different acid. But do they all produce acids? They all produce acids, but they're all different. Okay. And organic acids are often in solid form, like citric acid. Okay. Organic acid is in solid form. Um, that, so that's you, that's where you said rain plays an important part because right. the water source or some sort of humidity for them to then come into a liquid, a more aggressive form to act on the stone surface. Or they or or the liquid phase is reached by just as an incredibly high temperature mm. that never happens in real life. Okay. Um, any auto cleaning nanomaterials of lead oxide that you are aware of that can be used for marble cleaning? Since you said lead oxide is- lead, Yeah, lead oxide, no. You don't want to be the person applying nano lead. But I have been working with zinc oxide and perhaps that um, there's something there to be using zinc oxide. Okay. The next question is, is benzyl conium chloride used to remove biofilms commonly in the US? Do you use benzyl conium? Is that, um, is that a quad? I don't know that that's the chemical compound, benzyl Right. Do you use that to remove biofilms commonly in US? I see Dolores asked that question. Is yeah. that a quad? Yes. Yeah, uh, she's saying yes. Yes, yes. Quads, quads are used extensively. They produce that orange color and they don't, um, the holding power isn't that long. Mm -hmm. You know, you to keep repeated cleaning. In one case, for I saw it only lasted about two years. Okay. Now I'm seeing in another location in Memorial Amphitheater, about three years, four years, then it it turns around and they're no longer no longer efficient. Um, and the decomposition products may be. Um, maybe there and giving nutrients for the next population. And I don't like washing them into the soil. I don't like yeah. that aspect either. That's another problem, yes. Uh, so no more questions. So just to put it in perspective, Judy, given a choice, yeah, one more question. Has there been any study about specific types of lichens colonizing specific rock minerals? Any correlation that? Uh, yes, by lichenologists, yes. There are. By people in the preserve in my field, conservators, no. But we need to go into the lichenology literature. Okay. Okay. So as I was saying, the question is: given a choice, if if it were up to you, would you clean a biofilm in today's? given all your experience or let it be? No, I don't think I would. Um, we have, um, you know, we have when, all right, this is sort of a, maybe a longer answer. In the early 19th century, America was a new country and we absolutely did not want to use a British language of architecture. And so Americans looked to Greece and Rome. We needed an ancestry that was ancient. And we also had marble quarries. So we could build grand white marble buildings. You see all these columns, Washington DC. So our ancestry goes back to Greece and Rome and we have Greek um, vocabulary and we have lots of white marble. And that's continued. And, and now it's very hard for me to talk about white and black and clean and dirty. Mm. I can't do it. That just does not make sense. 
And so, and then I couple that with ecology and the need to keep chemicals out of the environment and the problems of erosion of marble with every cleaning and the fact that we don't really even know if we're providing protection by just leaving biofilms in place. Um, I'm an advocate for leaving them, but my voice is very small. Hmm. The desire to remove biofilms is huge, to have white marble looking white. I can understand. We have a similar issue in some of our important monuments as well. Well, not for biodegradation, but otherwise, we might do marble this thing. So, thank you so much, Judy. I think uh, those were the questions. Thank you, Padma. Thank you so and much for you your time. You all over India and other places. We, we have people from all over the world today. Yes, everybody's joined us. UK. Thank you everyone for joining us and making this an interesting session. Thank you so much, Judy, for answering the questions and for a lovely presentation. I think a lot of questions, as you rightly said, to think about um, increasing the decision-making process, making it more complex. But yes, hopefully there'll be more voices like yours. We've had a couple of presentations on biodegradation, and most of us do agree that this is something that we need to think, that not every biological uh, you know, biological film needs to be removed. More thorough study should be done to see the, you know, the pros and cons vis-a-vis uh, -vis the protection of the stone and what we are achieving by cleaning it. Maybe we are causing more trouble there then. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, Bye. goodbye. Bye.